นี่ยังจะพลังเมื่อนั้นบานเพียงวินิจฉัยทั้งตาดอสันตรูตั้งแต่เบอร์สมันเมื่อไอ้ตุลีนะเมื่อเคยจะเอียดนะเคยไปเรื่องอันนั้นอันโซ่คืออะไรนะอันนั้นอัดเองไปเจี๊ยบเต้าเฮยเต้าเฮยไอ้เจ้าคุณตุ๊กไอ้ไรสันดอสไรสันทุกจังองเดียกาสาวสไลจังปูปูลุ่นเต้บ้านขย่อมเด็กเมียกาสาวสไลเนี่ยประเภทภูเขาต้องยึดดอสไลยังไงต่อมาสมบัติกับติ๊งตุ๊กเธอไอ้ปวดตุ๊กเต้าอุ่นดอมปากปอดดอมบีเกียเธอปากไปจีจวนเธอปากไปจีจวนจังเป็นคนโพสสำคัญสำหรับเนี่ยเป็นอ่อนเรื่องตาอมอยู่คืออย่างนาได้ป่ะเพื่อนเขาเคยอย่างนั้นเป็นเรื่องก่อนโยนเคยอย่างนั้นโยนเคยดอสไลต์เอาสลักนะเอาสลักดอสไลต์เราจังหวะนี้ลูกลูกสไลจ์จะกระโดดเทสซัมบัตมีการตอบคำถามที่ดีเทสซัมบัตกับมิสเตอร์นูนเชียร์ในการตอบคำถามที่ดีเทสซัมบัตกับมิสเตอร์นูนเชียร์ในการตอบคำถามที่ดี When he asked, when Tet Sambat asked him why the CPK leaders had to kill the alleged traitors rather than just imprison them for life, Nunche had an interesting response. And I quote, Mr. Nunche, that is an easy question to ask. But a difficult one to answer. At that time, we had no proper prison, and if we kept them, they would spread and produce their eggs, and many more would have been killed. And the assertion that they did not have prisons, uh, obviously a a lie on his part. But what is most chilling are his words that follow. If we kept them, they would spread and produce their eggs. That is his justification for the killings. And we see in this a statement by Noon Chea, his agreement with the CPK practice, which you have heard extensively, of arresting and killing not only the person accused of disloyalty, but their spouses and children. If we kept them, they would spread and produce their eggs. Well, thank you for the time, uh, Your Honours. Uh, I will now, uh, Mr. Kumjian, International Prosecutor, will now address you on genocide. Thank you, Your Honours. Thank you, Your Honours. Is it possible to switch headsets? I'm having trouble with this. I could ask the court officer to help me. Okay, Good morning, Your Honours, Council. I want to begin by speaking uh, this morning about crimes against the Vietnamese and the Cham. And in particular, I want to address the charges of genocide uh, against these two groups and talk a little bit about the law of genocide because this is an area of international jurisprudence that is still developing and many people do not fully understand what the elements are of genocide. Genocide, Your Honours, is a crime against a group. Genocide does not depend 
upon the number of individuals killed. There's not a minimum number, like there is, for example, for exterminations. The charge of exterminations, and we have that charge. In, uh, in our case, there are several charges of extermination requires that killing be on a mass scale. And certainly that took place in cooperatives, work sites, and security centers. But genocide, theoretically, can be committed with a single killing. If that killing was done with the intent to destroy, a group, and a group has to be a national, ethnic, religious, or racial group. In this particular case, we have a genocide charge involving two groups, the Vietnamese in Cambodia and the Cham people in Cambodia. In 1946, shortly after the Second World War, the United Nations General Assembly passed a resolution on genocide. That term didn't even exist uh, some years earlier. But in the 11 December 1946 resolution, the General Assembly said that genocide is a denial of the right of existence of entire human groups, as homicide is the denial of the right to live of individual human beings. Such denial of the right to existence shocks the conscience of mankind results in great losses to humanity in the form of cultural and other contributions represented by these human groups and is contrary to moral law. The definition of genocide, if we can put that on the screen, um, your honors are familiar with it, but just to remind everyone, it's very particular. It requires any of five different types of acts committed with the intent to destroy in whole or in part, and those words are very important, a national, ethnical, racial, or religious group as such. And I'll be talking in a bit about the importance of those words as such. The five types of acts are killing members of the group first, and that is what is charged in this case, in the closing order, that the destruction of the Vietnamese and Chan groups in Cambodia was carried out, in, at least in part, by killing members of the group. But it's, I think, important to understand genocide, to also look at the other types of acts that are covered when they are committed with the intent to destroy the group. The second one is causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group. The third, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction. The fourth is imposing measures to prevent Birth. And the fifth, which is very important to understanding what genocide is about, forcibly transferring children of the group to another group. And I'll come back to that and its importance in a bit. But first, I'd like to address one point that, uh, in reading the defense briefs, particularly the Nuchia brief, the defense repeatedly got wrong about the intent and how intent is related to joint criminal enterprise. Repeatedly in the brief, the Nuchia makes the statement that the physical perpetrators of the acts have to share whatever specific intent is required of that crime with the members of the joint criminal enterprise. They cite the Virgin and Trial Judgment, paragraph 708. Now, they're correct that the Virgin and Trial Judgment said that. In fact, what the issue was in that trial was the issue that they were addressing in that paragraph. Did the physical perpetrator have to be a member of the joint criminal enterprise? That trial chamber ruled that they did. But that was overturned on appeal. 
on that very same case. Because the appeal chamber and all the subsequent appeals that have looked at this issue, all the jurisprudence, recognizes that the physical perpetrators can be used by members of the joint criminal enterprise to commit the crime. If you have the guards at Chungik with the hose killing Cham or Vietnamese, their specific intent is irrelevant. They're carrying out orders. The same as the shooters at Srebrenica, those that actually shot the 12,000 men and boys that was ruled to be a genocide. It's not important in the cases found that whether those shooters had the intent to destroy the group in whole and in part. If they were used by a member of the joint criminal enterprise to carry out that out. So in Burgeon and Appeal Judgment, in paragraph 410, the trial of the Appeals Chamber ruled that what matters in the first category of JCE is not whether the person who carried out the actus reus of a particular crime is a member of the JCE, but whether the crime in question forms part of the common purpose. And in Karadzic, uh, the 98 BIS decision of the Appeals Chamber in paragraph 79, this is stated even more explicitly. There the Appeals Chamber said it is not determinative whether the non-JC member shared the mens rea of the JC member or that the non-JC member knew of the existence of the JCE. It's the genocidal intent of Karajic, the accused person in that case, and other alleged JC members, not the physical perpetrators of the underlying alleged genocidal act that is determinative for the purpose of joint criminal enterprise. There's a book in our little library here at the BCCC called A Collective Theory of Genocidal Intent. And I think it makes the point very well on page 221 where the author says, low-level actors, the shooters, the executioners at Chung Ek, with the hose and with the knives, do not occupy a role that would allow them to destroy the group, and therefore they cannot truly form that intention. Whether physical perpetrators at the lower echelon of genocidal enterprises possess genocidal intent is no longer relevant to the attribution of physical liability of genocide. And that also cites this Karadzic Rule 98 BIS decision that I talked about. So now I want to move on and talk about crimes against the Vietnamese and particularly the genocide. What the evidence in this case shows is that the intent of what to do with the Vietnamese changed over time. In the beginning of the regime, the democratic Kampuchea regime, and even before that, probably starting in 1973, the CPK policy to remove the Vietnamese send them mainly to Vietnam, remove them from Cambodia. That intent evolved over time, and we see in the latter years of the regime that the intent was to destroy, to kill all those that remained, those that were Vietnamese, viewed by the CPK as Vietnamese, had some half-Vietnamese some Vietnamese in the background. Um, that's not unusual. In fact, if you, anyone who knows the history of the final solution, Hitler's plan for the Jews, he actually started out with the intention to remove Jews from all occupied German territory, and then that plan evolved to killing all that were in that territory. Now, transferring individuals 
is not itself one of the genocidal acts. So that wouldn't be genocide. However, it's important to look at that, and the jurisprudence shows that a transfer can be uh, important evidence of the intent to destroy the group, in this case the Vietnamese in Cambodia. In a similar situation, the first stage appeal chamber dealing with the crimes at Srebrenica. In Srebrenica, the evidence was you know, findings of all the trial chambers in those cases that the Serb forces collected men and boys of military age or close to military age and killed them and transferred out women and very young children. The Kursic Appeal Chamber held that the transfer of women, children, and the elderly from the enclave could be an additional means by which to ensure the physical destruction of the Bosnian Muslim community in Srebrenica. Because it eliminated, quote, even the residual possibility that the Muslim community in that area could reconstitute itself. In this uh, trial, we had a secretary of the autonomous sector, Sector 105, testify, Sao Sarun. And he was asked, in, this was in the 2 1, on the 6th of June 2012, uh, the question did they talk about driving all the UN from Cambodia? He answered, that was said, and the speaker was Paul Pot. If we look at the April 1976 issue of Revolutionary Flag, it describes this deportation. And this is E3759, Your Honors. It says that there are many foreigners, hundreds of thousands, and one type of foreigner that was very strongly poisonous and dangerous to our people. It says these, they came to wolf us down, came to nibble at us, came to swallow us, came to confiscate and take away everything and came to endanger our nation and our people. The revolutionary flag writes to its cadres, within 20 years these foreigners would certainly have increased to 10 million persons. However, our revolution, in particular on 17 April 1975, sorted this issue out cleanly and sorted it out entirely. Our democratic revolution swept hundreds of thousands of these foreigners clean and expelled them from our country and got them permanently out of our territory. But what the evidence, Your Honors, shows is that this policy of simply removing the Vietnamese, sending them to Vietnam, changed. And we know that from the evidence about what happened and the killings that, that occurred. And we know that also from the testimony of a high-level military cadre, Mies Boom. And this was, we believe, a critical revelation in this trial of the true intent and policy of the DK regime towards the Vietnamese and how this policy changed. So I'd ask that the first video clip be played, and this is Mia Spoon's testimony from the 2nd of February last year. ໂລກຊີທີ່ມັນໂດຍລໍາໃບບັງກໍເລື່ອງເຮັດອໍ
So later on, we were instructed that Vietnamese had to be smashed because they did not return to their country. That was how the policy changed. And the policy was communicated to cadre and to ordinary people by the top leaders of the DK, including the two accused on trial in this case, through various measures to incite hatred, to incite killings of Vietnamese. On the 3rd of September, 1978, Nguyen Chia praised the army for crushing the Vietnamese strategy of exterminating the Campuchian race. That's E3199. And this is so typical of genocide. The leaders, those who are inciting it, those who are planning it, those who are organizing it, will try to depict the victims as threats to the existence of their own people in order to incite that killing, in order to incite ordinary people to carry out their genocidal plans. Twelve days later, on 15 September, Nguyen Chia gave a speech. He's saying the Vietnamese, quote, will never abandon their ambition to wipe out the Kampuchean race. Pol Pot in April 1978, warned the cadre that if Vietnamese capture Cambodia, quote, the Kampuchean race will be gone within 30 years. So that would have been by 2008. Pol Pot was predicting that there would be no more Cambodians. Q Sam Pan referred to the Vietnamese as, quote, our sworn enemy. He said Cambodians must unite to, quote, smash the acts of aggression, expansion, and anti-Campuchian genocide by Vietnam. He called Vietnamese the worst criminals ever, ruthless, savage, international enemies. All this is from E3-296. Hugh Sampan said they were evil. This is 31 December 77, E3-8304. He called them barbaric and cruel, and, and Hugh Sampan said that the Vietnamese behaved like Hitler with, quote, no morality whatsoever. He claimed that they, the Vietnamese, engaged in genocidal aggression. Again in December, that same document, December 77, Hugh Sam Phan said that the Vietnamese enemy had, quote, raped and killed our women and wanted to, quote, enslave all our people and turn all of us into Vietnamese. The revolutionary flag, the magazine that we know Pol Pot and Nguyen Chia in particular were responsible for, in July 78 said it was the national duty of all of us to fight to eliminate our aggressive, expansionist, territorial swallowing, and genocidal UN enemy. It said the genocidal UN enemy of the Kampuchean race. All those words of incitement to further the genocidal policy. Nordam Singh, seeing of the late King Father, recalled, this is in document E3-1819, that he had a conversation with Q Sam Pan, where Q Sam Pan told him that to unite the people, quote, the best thing we could do was incite them to hate the Ewans more and more every day. So, I mean, this is not a matter of intent, but part of the motive of the genocide, which is often similar in other genocides. The DK leaders, to cover up the failures of their own regime, a regime that brought only misery and suffering to the people, looked for a foreign enemy to try to blame it all on them, to unite the people that, oh, all of your suffering and everything must be due to foreign enemies. In January 1978, Office 870 disseminated instructions emphasizing that, quote, it is imperative 
to constantly stir up national and class anger among the people toward the UN enemy invader. Office 870 at that time had one committee member, Q Sampan. His co-committee member, Duan, had already been arrested and sent to S21. <coughs> so this policy was transmitted from the top leaders down the chain of command, down to cadre, down to ordinary people. One of those, an ordinary soldier from the Navy Division, Pak Sok, testified in this court on the 16th of December of 2015 about the training that he had received about the Vietnamese. Um, may we please uh, play clip two that has his testimony. ສໍາລັບອັດມີນຕົກສົມໄບຕະກົນໄງ So I see the clip did not include the question, but the question was, now what exactly did the instructor say about the hereditary enemy, the Vietnamese? And again, he answered, we were instructed to kill, even if it was a baby, because they are our hereditary enemy. <laughs> now, was the intent really to kill all the Vietnamese? Well, I think if you want to know the intent of an organization, the, the words of the leader of that organization are critical. So let's look at a speech that Paul Pot gave, E3 slash 4604, slide number two, please. We put that on the screen. This is revolutionary flag and reproduces a speech that Paul Pot gave and was broadcast on the radio. He said, up until today, we have implemented one against 30, meaning we lose one, the UN lose 30. He went on to say, when we have 2 million, they need 60 million. So when we have 2 million, we already have more than we need to fight them because they only have 50 million. We don't need to use 8 million. We can use a force of only 2 million to fight and smash the UN and still have 6 million left. Now let's look at this remarkable, shocking statement. Pol Pot is saying, he's estimating 8 million Cambodians that he's willing to sacrifice 2 million of them. He can use 2 against 30 Two men can die in order to kill all the Vietnamese that exist. He says only 50 million. With just two million, we can kill all. It's not often that we have the luxury in a genocide trial of a statement so clear about the genocidal intent. Um, I could break now, Your Honor, or I'm about to move on a slightly different subject for continuing. <laughs> ผมพร้อมตลอดประการบรรทุกโรงจำขังกรอมสาธารณการนี้